Testing. Okay, this one's working. All right, how are we feeling? Is this good? All right, let me look at this first one because uh, now I'm a little sad about my quiz, but I, I can be happy in a minute. Oh yeah, okay. I see the problem. The problem is right here, this word. Okay, undamped motion. All right, so we'll have to modify the quiz just slightly, not bad. Uh, I'll tell you what to do once I give it to you. In fact, I can put it up here. Um, so uh, so you're, you're pretty good with the undamped motion. I should have had problems in the entire, like over here. Uh, where is the damped motion? Come on. Is this damped? Oh, yeah, there it is, damped. Well, I guess I'll be adding that to tonight's homework. You'll just have 20 or 30 problems for Friday. Okay, so let's go ahead and trade, and I'll just tell you right now, what I'd like you to do is just delete the damping coefficient. It's going to be gone. So I'll, I'll do it up here when I put it on the screen, but just the very last line of the stem of the problem, just delete that. No damping, and then the rest of it should be pretty easy. We can just pass these back. Oh, did anyone else get ripped off and not get a sticker last time that, that deserved one? Yeah, you can get some of this. Yeah, you can have these green egg and ham. Nice try. No, get it? That would be amazing. <laughs> I know. I have these stickers. I used to give them out to just special people because I didn't want to, you know, offend anyone. Uh, but someone like Frankie, she would love it. I would. Yeah, uh, I do not like the last one. <laughs> but you tried. Nice try. Okay, so delete the, the six newtons per meter per second thing. And I'm going to, I'll put it up here once I find it. Not to worry. Quiz 18. This is. Is this? Okay, if you were confused by what I just said, just here, here you go. Yeah, the rest of this is all good.
All right, hopefully you're coming down the home stretch. Uh, let's see, what do we have? Oh, we have homework and we have a quiz. All right, I'll take what you have. And if you're not done with the quiz, don't panic yet. I'll just uh, start collecting things. There you are, very nice. Good job. All right, do I have all of the quizzes? I know I've got all the homework. Oh, no, no, there's another quiz floating around. You can start panicking with it. Oh, all set? All right, I think I got them all. Got all the quizzes. Excellent. Uh, so here's my answers, such as they are. I hope I got them right. I didn't even look. Look at this. This person did the same thing as me, so I'm going to assume that I'm right, and you're right too. So I got x double prime. I got rid of the damping, so it's just x double prime plus 13x equals zero. That gave me this as my solution. I know, no work. <laughs> well, it's kind of easy, uh, 13, uh, radical 13i. And then there's my uh, initial conditions and my final answer, which I know, I didn't plug anything. Well, I did plug it in, did it all in my head. All right, so we're, we're okay with this. It's not bad. Uh, and so let's deal with the, the opposite one. Uh, we'll do this one now, or not the opposite, the one where there is damping. So isn't that fun? There's damping. And then we're going to add uh, driven motion. So we're almost to the end of the, the um, uh, harmonic oscillator section. By the way, if you have a, any circuit that involves, that has a um, capacitor, in it. So, so like a, a capacitor and a resistor or a capacitor and an inductor, or all three of them, you will have a very similar situation to this. You'll have a, a harmonic oscillator in your circuit. And you can do the same exact math that we're doing here, 
but for that uh, system. So if you're an electrical engineer, I'm sure you'll see stuff like that at some point. But let's just deal with this. It's not that hard. Um, so we have one, we'll just go ahead and do this, x double prime plus six times x prime plus 13x equals zero. So notice the difference. Here there's no damping. Here there is damping. So you have that additional term there. Okay, so we have r squared plus 6r plus 13 equals zero of characteristic equation. This does not factor, sadly. So we're going to have to resort to the um, quadratic formula that you all know and love. Let's see, 4 times a times c, that's 26. No, what am I thinking? It's 54. Cards in a deck, come on. Oh, 54 if, oh yeah, there's 52. I was thinking of the jokers, sorry. Yeah, you think if I'm doing math magic, I kind of know this. Okay, that's better. 13 times 4 is 52, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is all over 2. So far so good? Did I? Am I doing my math all right? Yeah, this is probably not too difficult. I probably could have just left it as it is for the quiz, but since you didn't have any damped motion on your uh, homework, I kind of felt bad about it. So anyway, um, this isn't bad. This is going to be negative 6 plus or minus square root of, is that 16? Negative 16 over 2. And so that's going to be negative 3 plus or minus 2i. Oh, yeah, 2i. Because the square root of negative 16 is uh, 4i. And divide by 2, and you get 2i. So is that all right? This, I mean, this is just basic algebra here. So. OK, so that's, that's going to give us the general solution, the general solution. And so here, let's be careful, because I noticed on your test, wherever it ended up, some of you didn't get this one right. Uh, so here, x is equal to c1 e to the negative 3t. So you take the real part, and that goes up in the exponent. And then cosine of 2t, that's the imaginary part, ends up in the cosine and sine. C2 e to the negative 3t sine of 2t. So not too bad. Uh, so your general solution, that's what you'll end up with when you have damped motion. This one is called an underdamped system. So this is the one which continues to bounce up and down just slower and slower as time goes on. So underdamped, you get a sine or a cosine. Overdamped, you have real roots, and it just you just have these exponential functions that go very quickly to zero towards the equilibrium. Okay, now that we have that, let's go ahead and compute the um, constants of integration here, the c1 and c2. So uh, let's get our derivative. Ooh, hold on. Product rule. Minus 2 e to negative 3t sine. Sorry about this. Uh, this is a very good reason not to have done the um, damped motion on the quiz is for this very reason right here, because that's only half of the derivative. The other half is this, negative 3 e to the negative 3t sine 2t. Let me get rid of that superfluous. There it is. Uh, and then plus 2 e to the negative 3t cosine. Uh, I should have made you do this part. Well, too late now. Well, now that you've got the function, its derivative, you can come up with the equations for these two things. So x of 0 equals 5 and x prime of 0 equals 0. Take a minute, write down those equations, see if you can solve for x for c1 and c2. That'll give me a chance to check my uh, Clash Royale here.
we should have our own clan that the differentials. I would join that. What? Oh yeah, just to be on the uh, the the uh, what can we call it? Something derivatives. The, uh, you can come up with some clever name. All right, let's see. Not differential. All right, we're randomizing now. All right, Clayton, what does this look like, this x of 0 equals 5? What does that equation end up looking like? Okay, times 1, okay. That's also one, okay. All right, very nice. Oh, so we have this nice situation again. Since the sine of, of, of zero is zero, uh, this is so nice that five is equal to C1. So you can actually plug that in right here when we go to do this next equation. So let's do the next one. Here, I'll get you started. Zero is equal to five times. <laughs> and then plus, here, we'll get, we'll get the rest of it in a sec. All right, so Aaron, what do you think? Can you, can you do at least the parenthetical thing there next to the five? Uh, yeah, so I got it. Uh, so that's this stuff right here. Just oh, plug okay. zero in. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay, so you actually computed it. All right. And then this, since you got it all computed, let's get the rest of it. By two. Very nice. So, uh, yeah, Aaron just plugged zero into all of these and very quickly in his head did the calculation. That's what he got. So very nice. But if you don't believe him, or if you just need some extra help saying, where'd the two come from? I could talk you through it, but I think we all know that the cosine of zero is one. Okay, onward. So let's see, we've already got C1. So that means that this would be 15 is equal to 2C2. So C2 is 15 halves. So I guess my final solution is Y is equal to 5E to the negative 3T times the cosine of 2t plus 15 halves e to the negative 3t sine of 2t. That's not too bad. You can do, yeah. Yes, it should. There, got a nice big x, thank you. <laughs> okay, we've done that. Okay. Where's my spring? Uh, I always love my toys. Just don't tell uh, Dr. Ho that I have this. Uh, I just went down to his uh, lab and just took, took, I just think of it as my own <laughs> toys. Well, see, I grew up with a physics professor for a father, so I always thought that the lab was mine anyway. I would go in there and just play with the toys. It was great. Um, but anyway, so here is a, here's a spring mass system. And uh, if this was attached to the ceiling, it would be exactly, well, very similar to what we just had there. But it's attached to my arm now. And you'll notice that it's not slowing down. In fact, it's getting faster. And the reason why it's getting faster is I'm adding energy to this system. I could also add energy in a different way and slow it down. There. So depending on how you add the energy, you'll either speed the system up. Okay. We'll talk about that. That's actually coming up. It's the next item on the list. But, uh, um, but anyway, uh, you can either speed things up, slow things down, uh, adding energy. The energy that you add doesn't necessarily have to be cyclic like I've been doing. I can add energy by just, if you can imagine me standing on that elevator out there holding this and then pressing start and the elevator moves up 
that is actually adding energy to the system in a sense. Um, so that would elongate the spring for a moment. And then when I got to the second floor, it would stop elongating it and I would end up with this nice uh, motion. Uh, so even if it was at rest, once you add some energy to the system, you end up with what's called driven motion because you're adding some sort of a forcing function, adding a force to the system. Now that force gets added as an additional, so, so if you want to think of these things like this, you have the force uh, mass times acceleration. That's the force uh, of gravity, if you will, or just the force that is inherent in movement. And then you have that added to the, the force of, um, well, I should probably use X instead of A here. I'm just used to mass times acceleration is equal to force. In fact, I can't tell you how many times I've been biking with my, uh, like I go with the bike group around here and uh, I'm going down a hill and I pass everyone on the hill. And as I go, as I go past them, they're probably sick of me saying force equals mass times acceleration because <laughs> I've got a lot of mass. But anyway, <laughs> they're, they're scientists as well. They're like a couple of biologists from Kenyon and some other people from around here. Um, like some engineers from, uh, from Ariel that I bike with. Anyway, so here's, uh, there it is. Yeah, they're all little skinny people too. And they like biking behind me. I don't know why. Well, maybe it has to do with this term right there. <laughs> okay, but anyway, getting back to this. Uh, so you have this force. That's the force, the motion force. This is the force that is inherent in the, the, um, uh, the, the resistance, the air resistance or whatever it is, the, if you're moving through a fluid, some sort of damping. And then the final thing is the spring restorative force. Anyway, you have all of those forces and they get balanced by whatever force you're adding. And so the force that you're adding, I'm just gonna add like this, F of T. So F of T. So that there is the forcing function. It's, uh, so it's the additional, the, dri the driving force that you're adding to this system. If we're talking about, and I suppose we probably should just at least uh, um, pay homage to the, um, what is it called? The, the circuits. So let me just, I'll just show you this just so that you understand what I'm doing here, what I'm talking about. There it is. Okay, there, there's a circuit. Okay, yeah, you don't have to write this down. I just wanted to sort of point out that you have an inductor, resistor, and a capacitor. I know those are, especially, what is that? I did my best. I probably did this 10 years ago, and I'm like, oh, oh do whatever I can. Okay, but the resistor, and this is what a capacitor looks like, right? I mean, literally, it's two pieces of metal with a piece of paper in between them, uh, just wound up in a big coil. Okay, so anyway, there it is. Um, that's the LRC circuit, and uh, so these are the voltage drops in the LRC circuit across the inductor. Uh, you have L times the derivative of the current. So, uh, and then across the resistor, it is the resistance times the current. And then across the capacitor, it's 1 over C times Q, uh, which is the charge in the capacitor. So you have these different voltage drops. The, the one that we're all familiar with is voltage is equal to IR. Right, so that one's that one there. But anyway, so you've got these things, all of these voltage drops, and the sum of the voltage drops has to equal zero. Is that Kirchhoff? Kirchhoff? I know, I've been pronouncing it wrong the, all of my life. You would think that I could have figured it out having a, a physicist as a father, but apparently not. Um, but anyway, so you end up with this sort of thing. Uh, so there you go. Uh, but the problem is you have two different dependent variables. That is not something that we are studying in here. But fortunately for us, uh, we know that the um, current happens to be the derivative of the charge. Is that right? Current is derivative of charge? Well, I believe that's the case. And so you end up with this. Well, not only do I believe it, I know it's the case. And so this, what, what this is, that ends up being the charge the derivative of the charge, and this is the second derivative of the charge. And so here's what the, the model ends up looking like. It looks like this. Here's what our uh, um, spring mass system looks like. You'll notice that they are almost exactly the same. So whenever I mention that the 
uh, um, something about uh, uh, LRC circuits, it's because it is the exact same differential equation. Just the, the letters that we use are different, but everything else is the same. This thing here, so this forcing function, I like the spring mass system because I can actually show you, uh, if I can get it to hook on, I can actually show you my forcing function. I can move this up and down, and okay, I shouldn't do it that way. Uh, maybe I'll go slower. There we go, I've got a forcing function. So I'm moving this thing, and it is, it is adding energy to the system. It's a little harder to show you the forcing function in an LRC circuit like the light bank up here. And right now there's no energy being added, no voltage. And then in just a minute, I'm going to add a sine wave or something akin to a sine wave. And there it goes. And it lights up, but you can't really see what's going on up there. So that's why I like the springs and masses. But all of the differential equations are the same. Instead of a forcing function, you have electricity going into like from a battery, or in this case, you have a alternating current going into those light banks up there. And I don't think, no, these are still, these aren't LEDs. These are actually, um, so there must be a capacitor up there somewhere uh, to charge the, the, the bulb there. Those are uh, fluorescents. So anyway, getting back to the problem that we were doing, here we go. So what I'd like to do is just explore what happens when you have a forcing function. So let's go ahead and pick a nice, simple problem. We're going to use a mass of 0 0.5. We're going to have a spring constant of 1. And we're going to have a forcing function of, how about, cosine of t, just to see what happens. Oh, and you might wonder, what's beta? Well, for now, let's let, let beta equal zero. Anyway, see if you can set up this differential equation, and then we'll solve it. So if you, if you want to go ahead and solve it, you go right ahead, but we'll get it set up, then we're going to solve it and see what happens. All right, so first the setup. The setup isn't hard because you're just copying down numbers. Triton, go ahead and tell me what to write down for this particular differential equation. Don't you mean why? And no, I'm just kidding, go ahead. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Okay, I'll just leave that term out. Very nice. Ah, this looks familiar, doesn't it? Didn't you have something like this on your test that you just got back? We did. Uh, so what we have to do here is we first of all have to solve the homogeneous equation. The homogeneous equation looks like this. I can do, you can do this. So take a minute and see if you can solve that. And then we'll get this y sub h, or x sub h, I guess, since this is all x's. But you could almost do that in your head. I don't know. Maybe you can't. I'll, I'll, I'll leave a little bit of room in case we need to write anything down. Preston isn't here. He would he would know, maybe. I'll pick another person. Bryant is here and he doesn't know. No, I'm just kidding. So so uh so what what would the characteristic equation be then? That's why I left a little gap. Yeah, I'm gonna use an R so it doesn't get confused with the X up there. Okay, so that means that r squared is equal to negative 2. So what would r equal? Plus or minus square root of 2 i. Very nice. Square root of 2 times i. Okay, so that gives us the, the characteristic roots, and now we can just put those together to make the homogeneous part. Travis, do you know what the homogeneous equation or solution is?
Nice. Excellent. Okay, very good. All right, now I got to remember. Oh, it's been three weeks. Oh, I remember. You just take a guess and you use the undetermined coefficients. There was another method, the variation of parameters, but we really didn't spend a lot of time with that one. Eventually, we'll have yet another method called Laplace transforms, but that's not for a few weeks. So let's go ahead and do this using undetermined coefficients. And so we first of all have to have a guess, x sub p, for the particular solution. And notice that the guess is going to be built from that, that forcing function. That is going to tell you what that's going to be. So, Gabriel, do you have any ideas as to what you're going to use for x sub p? So, so what is what is this? How would you what, what would you how would you say that? What do you mean in terms of it's the it's like the leftover from the homogeneous. Uh, yeah, but can you read those word oh, letters? Cosine. Very good. It's cosine of t. Very good. And then that's part of it. So we'll we'll go a times that. And then you need another piece. What would happen if you did the derivative of that? Sine of t, very good. So uh, there, phew. So remember the particular solution, you take the forcing function, the stuff on the other side, and you just take that and then all of its derivatives, and there's my, uh, my guess for the particular solution. Now, the only thing you have to worry about, though, is if this and this overlap. You remember this whole idea of overlapping? Uh, and when they overlap, then you have to do something special, but we don't have to do anything special here. These don't overlap. I know they're both cosines, but this is the cosine of t, cosine of radical 2t. They are not the same function. So those are not the same. So we're okay. So we start off with this, and now we're going to do xp prime and xp double prime. Do you remember this process? I know it's been three weeks. I was having trouble as well. We're all in this together. Okay. Let's find our, our next person. Corey knows what to do. What's the derivative of this thing? I, I think I might have misheard you. I thought I heard you a, a T in there, but I don't think you meant that. Just the, the B, right? There's no T. So... Uh, if you want to put anything in there, you could do one. You could put a one in there. Yeah, maybe that's what you were meaning to say. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so we got that. Now we need the second derivative. Jason, what do you get for the second derivative? <coughs> Very nice. Okay, now we're going to stick all of this stuff into the original differential equation down there. And... I guess I'll just make this really small, and then I'll blow it back up. So uh, we have 0 0.5 times the second derivative. Plus the original function, which is this. And that should equal cosine of t. Uh-oh, I didn't leave myself enough room. Give me a sec. Okay, there it is, way zoomed out, so that the top line there matches the bottom line. I'll zoom back in in just a sec. I just want to make sure that you can compare and contrast. Yeah, what do you think, Darren? When we're writing x sub p, we do, our guess is uh, whatever it is. And Whatever's there. Whatever the derivative of it is. All the derivatives. So, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah I know it's been like a, a month. It's been like a month since we did this, isn't it? So, like, for example, if this were t squared, you would do a times t squared plus b times t plus c times a constant. So, so when do we stop for, like, cosine? Well. Uh, okay, let's start with cosine. Yeah. 
What's the derivative of cosine? And then what's the derivative of negative sine? Cos oh, it's already there. Yeah. Okay. So you don't need to duplicate effort. Once you have, once you, once it loops around. And same thing, if this were e to the t, mm -hmm. you would have a e to the t plus o. Oh, it's its own derivative. So we're done. Did we? Did the b eat the negative from the negative sign? Uh, yes. Okay. If you want, yeah, I know you like to talk about uh, the, the consumption of constants. So we should maybe a math copy or next time I have to make snack, I can have some constants. That's my snacks, and then we can all eat the constants. Do you have any dietary restrictions? Dairy. Dairy, okay. So you need to avoid the dairy, no icing. Or if the frosting, it can be, uh, okay, I'll make sure that they're uh, consumable. Okay, I got to turn this back on. Oh, no, what's going on here? Just a minute. My, my thing just, uh, here, just a sec. I have to just turn it off for a sec. Turn it back on. That's better. Okay, is everyone else any other uh, any other issues or questions about this? Okay, let's collect like terms. Notice that there is one cosine over here and zero signs. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to pull all the cosines, put them in a group. All the signs, put them in a group. So let's see, where are the cosines? I have a cosine right here. Uh, whoops, this is not good to highlight blue with blue. Okay, how about that? There's a cosine and here's a cosine. Okay, so let's put them together. You have negative 0.5a plus a all times cosine. What about the signs? Let's put them together. They all want to be together. So you have this one and you have this one. I know it looks like it's negative uh, um, b times, but it, don't forget this uh, 0.5 out here. So you have negative 0.5b plus b all times sine. All right, we're almost there. This stuff here has to equal one. This stuff here has to equal zero because there is one cosine over here and there are no signs over here. So uh, let's see, we have 0.5a equals one and 0.5b equals zero. That means a has to equal two and b has to equal zero and we're done. Uh, well, we're not quite done. We have x is equal to C1 times the cosine, hold on a minute, I forget, radical 2, okay, cosine of radical 2t plus C2 sine of radical 2t plus 2 cosine of t. Now we're done, at least with the general solution. So there's the general solution. I mean, this really isn't that surprising. Just to, I mean, I don't, I shouldn't say it that way, but uh, it's not all that different from what we did before the break. So you're dealing with additional, you know, this this forcing function over here, but it's the same as what we did for the test. So I think we'll be okay, hopefully. Okay, so let's just briefly mention resonance. Resonance is what happens when the forcing function has a frequency that is very close to the natural frequency for the harmonic oscillator. Uh, for example, here, uh, well here, there, uh, the frequency for the forcing function, well, just take the, you can take the coefficient of, of t in the parentheses as a stand-in for frequency. It's not exactly, but here it's radical two, here it's one. Those numbers are pretty close to one another. What's going to happen is that the cosine over there, that cosine of t, is going to interact with this cosine of two, the radical 2t, two and they will create this sort of situation where um, the wave form that results from these two will get added together sometimes, and sometimes they'll cancel each other out, but it's the adding of them together that's going to be the problem. Uh, like here, uh, let's see, the natural frequency, what did we determine? It's like one every second or something oh that's for the whole spring okay there it is so so if i add energy at that same rate that's when you start having bridges falling down and uh and skyscrapers breaking and stuff like that so uh um that's something to be avoided if you can figure out what the the resonance or the natural frequency is using something like this you can avoid 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can or not, but famous example, of course, is some of the bridge disasters like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. If you've ever seen that video, it's always fun to watch the twisting motion. Not exactly a spring mass system because this, the, the, the cables act as springs when the roadbed is below equilibrium, but above equilibrium, they go slack. So it, they're just in free fall, uh, the, the, the roadbed. So not exactly, but anyway, it's just something interesting. Midterm, so midterm grades were due yesterday. So I, I just made up some things, but if you aren't happy with your letter grade, please do uh, take a look at the grade book in Moodle and see what it says. And if there's issues, like uh, maybe I made mistakes, I'm happy to fix those. Also, you can always hand in late homework and I might give it, to, even if it's like a 50% discount, it's better than nothing. So please do uh, take care of that. Homework preview. There's a few homework problems. Did I put that online yet? I think I did. I hope so. Uh, let me double check and we'll see. And then we'll just talk really quick about the math magic since uh, Triton is done. Yeah, there's three problems. Same page, 25, 27, 33. They'll be pretty straightforward and hopefully not too difficult. Uh, finally, math magic. This is a course that I taught like, well, actually I learned math magic 20 years ago. And then about 10 or 12 years ago, I had a group of students saying, hey, we want to take math magic. And I said, OK, we'll do it. Uh, and so I had a course. And this one of the guys actually uses it. He's a teacher in North Carolina. He uses it in his classes. And he um, like motivates his students that way. Uh, so it was a three credit class. I've done it a couple other times, three credit class. Always felt a little too long. So I've reduced it to one credit. I had a couple of students begging me to do it next year. And so that's what this is. Uh, it's, it does count, and it is actually mathematics, but you only have to know up through about algebra to be able to understand what's going on. I know it's so boring. Uh, but anyway, you get to learn some card tricks and some other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, come to, um, yeah, come to coffee hour. I can show you some. So, yeah, so coffee hour is right now. If you want to stop by, get a cookie, and uh, learn a, a a card trick. You don't have to take those flyers with you. I just had them out from this morning. Yeah, yeah, you, you go ahead. All right. Oh, all right. Go team. Go team. My coach. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you.